Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. You can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 10. Tariff of Licensed Cabs. Two francs an hour. Marius had lost nothing of this entire scene, and yet, in reality, had seen nothing. His eyes had remained fixed on the young girl. His heart had, so to speak, seized her and wholly enveloped her from the moment of her very first step in that garret. During her entire stay there, he had lived that life of ecstasy which suspends material perceptions and precipitates the whole soul on a single point. He contemplated... Not that girl, but that light which wore a satin pelisse and a velvet bonnet. The star Sirius might have entered the room, and he would not have been any more dazzled. While the young girl was engaged in opening the package, unfolding the clothing and the blankets, questioning the sick mother kindly, and the little injured girl tenderly, he watched her every moment. He sought to catch her words. He knew her eyes. Her brow, her beauty, her form, her walk. He did not know the sound of her voice. He had once fancied that he caught a few words of the Luxembourg, but he was not absolutely sure of the fact. He would have given ten years of his life to hear it, in order that he might bear away in his soul a little of that music. But everything was drowned in the lamentable exclamations and trumpet bursts of John Drett. This added a touch of genuine wrath to Marius's ecstasy. He devoured her with his eyes. He could not believe that it really was that divine creature whom he saw in the midst of those vile creatures in that monstrous lair. It seemed to him that he beheld a hummingbird in the midst of toads. When she took her departure, he had but one thought. To follow her. To cling to her trace. Not to quit her until he learned where she lived. Not to lose her again, at least. After having so miraculously rediscovered her... He leapt down from the commode and seized his hat. As he laid his hand on the lock of the door and was on the point of opening it, a sudden reflection caused him to pause. The corridor was long, the staircase steep. Jondrette was talkative. Monsieur Leblanc had no doubt not yet regained his carriage. If on turning round in the corridor or on the staircase he were to catch sight of him, Marius, in that house... He would evidently take the alarm and find means to escape from him again, and this time it would be final. What was he to do? Should he wait a little? But while he was waiting, the carriage might drive off. Marius was perplexed. At last, he accepted the risk and quitted his room. There was no one in the corridor. He hastened to the stairs. There was no one on the staircase. He descended in all haste and reached the boulevard in time to see a fiacre turning the corner of the Rue des Petites Banquières on its way to Paris. Marius rushed headlong in that direction. On arriving at the angle of the boulevard, he caught sight of the fiacre again, rapidly descending the Rue Mofotard. The carriage was already a long way off, and there was no means of overtaking it. What? Run after it? Impossible. And besides, the people in the carriage would assuredly notice an individual running at full speed in pursuit of a fiacre, and the father would recognize him. At that moment, wonderful and unprecedented good luck, Marius perceived an empty cab passing along the boulevard. There was but one thing to be done, to jump into this cab and follow the fiacre. That was sure, officious, and free from danger, Marius made the driver assigned a halt and called to him. By the hour. Marius wore no cravat. He had on his working coat, which was destitute of buttons. His shirt was torn along one of the plates on the bosom. The driver halted, 
winked, and held out his left hand to Marius, rubbing his forefinger gently with his thumb. "'What is it?' said Marius. "'Pay in advance,' said the coachman. Marius recollected that he had but sixteen sous about him. "'How much?' he demanded. Forty sous. I will pay on my return.' The driver's only reply was to whistle the air of La Police and to whip up his horse. Marius stared at the retreating cabriolet with a bewildered air. For the lack of four and twenty sous, he was losing his joy, his happiness, his love. He had seen, and he was becoming blind again. He reflected bitterly, and it must be confessed with profound regret, on the five francs which he had bestowed that very morning on that miserable girl. If he had had those five francs... He would have been saved. He would have been born again. He would have emerged from the limbo in darkness. He would have made his escape from isolation and spleen. From his widowed state. He might have re-knotted the black thread of his destiny to that beautiful golden thread which had just floated before his eyes, and had broken at the same instant once more. He returned to his hovel in despair. He might have told himself that Monsieur Leblanc had promised to return in the evening, and that all he had to do was to set about the matter more skillfully, so that he might follow him on that occasion. But in his contemplation, it is doubtful whether he had heard this. As he was on the point of mounting the staircase, he perceived, on the other side of the boulevard, near the deserted wall skirting the Rue de la Barriere des Gobelins, John Drett, wrapped in the philanthropist's greatcoat, engaged in conversation with one of those men of disquieting aspect who have been dubbed by common consent, Prowlers of the barriers. People of equivocal face. Of suspicious monologues. Who present the air of having evil minds, and who generally sleep in the daytime, which suggests the supposition that they work by night. These two men, standing there motionless and in conversation, in the snow which was falling in whirlwinds, formed a group that a policeman would surely have observed, but which Marius hardly noticed. Still, in spite of his mournful preoccupation, he could not refrain from saying to himself that this prowler of the barriers with whom Jondrette was talking resembled a certain Panchard, alias Printanier, alias Bigrenelle, whom Corferac had once pointed out to him as a very dangerous nocturnal roamer. This man's name the reader has learned in the preceding book. This Panchard, alias Printanier, Alias Bigrenelle figured later on in many criminal trials and became a notorious rascal. He was at that time only a famous rascal. Today, he exists in a state of tradition among ruffians and assassins. He was at the head of a school towards the end of the last reign. And in the evening, at nightfall, at the hour when groups form and talk in whispers, he was discussed at La Force in Fossa Lions. One might even, in that prison, precisely at that spot where the sewer which served the unprecedented escape in broad daylight of thirty prisoners in 1843, passes under the culvert, read his name, Panchad, audaciously carved by his own hand on the wall of the sewer during one of his attempts at flight. In 1832, the police already had their eye on him. But he had not as yet made a serious beginning. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlyle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget you can sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com, and while you're there, check out our t-shirt shop. You can look in the show notes or on our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media. You can find us everywhere at Bite at a Time Books.